All right, so this next speaker, we probably have all heard of him or used one of his fabulous packages because he creates a lot of amazing stuff. And I've had the pleasure of eating of him all around the world. We're both really big eaters. But I've never, everyone knows that about me, right? I mean, like food. But I've never been so scared being between someone and tiramisu before. It was frightening. Please welcome Max. Hi, how you doing? Thanks for coming. Um, also, everybody who's here virtually, thanks for sticking around till like, you know, the end of the day on the second day. Uh, appreciate you being here. So, okay, so we're gonna talk about um, monitoring after you've built your model. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Slides are here on GitHub if you want them. I'll tweet that out in a little bit. So here's the thing, you've, you've done all this great stuff, you've built this amazing model, you've solved the company's woes, you've, you know, you've excelled at what you're trying to do, and you know, what do you do now? And so in most situations, um, you, know, you wanna do all the post-modeling activities, otherwise known as like model operations usually. And you know, I used to do this in my last job a lot. I need a timer, sorry. <laughs> um, don't mind the, the help. Um, uh, and you know, we, we used to have a lot of, we would publish models internally with like an internal system, but the consumers of those models were very, very technically savvy and they were very eager to know about like what happened. Just don't give me a number. So we had to spend a lot of like copious amounts of time describing like which data do we use, how much was there, which predictors. You know, there's obvious stuff like, you know, what was your model performance? But you know, we had to do a little bit about like the development of the model and that model documentation really, really pays off um, if, especially if you're in a situation where um, the, the number's just not getting fed into some other subsystem and nobody ever sees it. So, you know, there's, there's these things called model cards, uh, which seem like a really good, um, like, first, like, template for ways of um, describing what your model did, okay? So if you're doing this and you're productionizing models, it's really critical that you document your model um, but it's a, it's a bit like writing documentation for functions. Nobody really wants to do it. Okay, so it's, it's pretty important. Um, so, so once you've documented your model, then you probably want to deploy it and monitor it. So let's talk about just deployment for a minute. This is not a deployment talk. But you probably have some like really amazing, exciting, like really revolutionary software that you might think about using for deploying your model. So if you haven't seen this, we just kind of released this the other day. Um, it's for R and Python, and it's called Vetiver. This is not a Vetiver talk, but you know, having spent a lot of time thinking about model deployment um, and how we do things, or how people generally want things, um, Julia Silgi and her team have been spending a lot of time on you know, how to stash a model somewhere, version it, um, give a REST API for predictions, you know, there's templates for the model card and, and so on. So if, if this is something you're interested in, it, I feel like it's a problem where when I look at any solution for model deployment, they all seem to be over-engineered for the wrong things, the things we don't really care about. And so everyone I've either used or looked at or tried to use, I felt like, oh, this is not a great experience. So Vetiver was really designed to be pretty seamless and pretty much doing the things that we think is like really important to focus on. So there's that. So um, once you've productionized it, you, know, you start getting data in, and hopefully some of that data you'll get labels on. And so if you do have like, the true value and your prediction, then you can start doing monitoring over time. And so the idea would be that you, know, you, you deploy a model, you start using it, but maybe at some point it's not really working as well as it did when you first uh, published it. And so, um, so you might see performance sort of drift from a baseline value um, that, like, that you calculated when you first built the model. And so um, it's a little bit pedantic, and I, if you've seen my talks, I usually have like wall of technical detail, and I usually don't have like the one sentence on a slide. But really, the, the crux of what I want to initially say is this, that we talk about model drift all the time, and there's actually really no such thing as model drift. It's impossible to have model drift. And, and so we use that term a lot, and, and you might say like, well, okay, like maybe I'll accept that. Um, but you know, words have a lot of meaning sometimes, and I worry about like if we talk about a model drifting and we want to solve that problem, then there's a focus because we call it that to make that a problem for the model. But it's actually not a, a model problem at all because the thing is, your model's static. Once you've built the model, unless you're about to retrain it 
or update it, even if it's like a Bayesian model where you're like sampling from a posterior, the model itself at that point is done. It's like in amber, right? So, so the model is not gonna like, your regression coefficients aren't gonna like silently change in the night and do something. So you know, the point is, it's not really so much about the model, that's like a filter, like a piece of glass. It's like the, the light you're shining through the model, if that's changing, what comes out of that model is the thing that you care about. And so really it's the inputs we should be really, really focusing on. And you might, you might think about it from the perspective um, of, I'll, I'll keep using the word uh, applicable here, um, what you want to see is if your data are changing substantially over time and the model is not really knows how to compensate for that, then your, your, all your performance metrics and everything, those are the things that are really drifting. But it's not your model's fault. Your model's really not to blame. And so the one way you can think about this is at what point are my, is my model not applicable for the type of data that I'm receiving in the wild now that may be different than what I had when I first built the model. So it turns out that, um, and this has probably been reinvented um, in many different places, but I most know these types of methods as these, these things called applicability domain models. So I, I used to work in drug discovery, did a lot of modeling um, with computational chemists. And they pretty much have, I think they're like, you know, a couple years ahead of everybody in terms of deploying and managing models. And they had this idea that you want to somehow characterize the domain of data that your model is applicable. Okay, and there's a bunch of different ways you could do that. The main way that people usually think about it is let's measure some, well, let's find some way to characterize or quantify how far we're extrapolating from our training set. So you know, there's the assumption that if you have a data point, it's really nothing like your training set, that that, you know, that data point might be kind of sus, right? So you don't know because you don't know the true value. But most of the applicability domain uh, metrics and models are really about measuring extrapolation. Now, a harder thing you can do with, with applicability domains, and there's not that many methods to do this, are um, have an applicability domain model that sort of understands where your model just doesn't predict well, regardless of where the data was. So even if it's something, you have a data point that's like something in your training set, there might be areas of your training set that just don't fit well. And there are some applicability domain methods that sort of try to quantify that and give you like a little heads up that you know, you're not in a good place for your model. So you know, this is not like really like a terribly new idea. There's anomaly detection, there's one class classification, there's a bunch of other places where methods like these, but the interesting thing here is it's, it's a secondary piece of information that goes along with your model prediction to tell you how much you should really think about using it or how much trust you should put in it. So it's more like a credibility thing. So really what we'll focus on is the primary like way to think about this is Applicability domain methods really try to characterize where your data mainstream is. And the data in question is really your training set. And then when you get a new data point, whether it's your test set or some data point like two weeks or two years later, how much does that new data point resemble or how similar is it to my original training set? So there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. The, the two simplest things you could do are like linear methods, principal component analysis, and hat matrix, if you remember the, like the hat matrix is something that like I mentioned, so like, yeah, I remember my, my like regression teacher mentioning something about a hat. Um, but they're, they're basically like linear methods to measure how far your data are from like the center of your training set. And with PCA, that's actually a, it's a fairly elegant way to do that because when you run principal component analysis on your training set, especially if there's correlation, the, the resulting components have a nice, usually have a fairly um, uh, nice distribution and it's really easy to calculate the distance with a new point to the center of your, uh, your PCA uh, co um, components for your training set. So those are two like sort of standard ways of doing it. Um, again, there's like one class, class classification. Tukey's data depth is something I learned about like about 10 years ago, which he wrote um, a bunch of methods that really like are an umbrella around like uh, Mahabalomus, uh, I can never say it right, uh, distance and a couple of other int interesting ways to say like where in my distribution does any particular data fall, even if it's a very multivariate distribution. That's pretty cool. Um, the thing I'll talk about just briefly is uh, isolation forests. The nice thing about isolation forests is they tend to be you know, relatively fast and they can really um, compensate for nonlinear trends. So if you're fitting like a big nonlinear model, you might not want to do PCA or hat values because you're really measuring similarity in a, like a linear way. And you might be using a nonlinear model that doesn't think about this, the, the training set that way. So that might not be a bad way of going about things. 
Um, so you build this thing called an applicability domain model, which is like a secondary model, and then you can score new samples with it. And if you want to do that, um, a few uh, years ago, we had a great intern at our studio, uh, Marley, who wrote a package called Applicable that has a lot of this stuff in it. Uh, we, have a, we have a version that should be on CRAN soon once we figure out like, what their issue is with a, a DOI reference. That's like the kind of thing that holds up a CRAN submission. Um, that's a good time. But if you want to learn more, we have a, uh, um, some about this in the Tiny Models book in Chapter 17. Um, so you can, you can read more there. And, um, and there's some references at the end. So isolation forest is actually a pretty, to me, like novel idea. Is you've probably seen like random forests and like decision trees. Um, and, this, and what isolation forests do is they, much like a tree, they find predictors within your data set and they make splits of that predictor and then sort of like hierarchically make those splits down the line and probably until like you run out of data. But the difference with an isolation forest is the predictors are chosen at random and the split points are chosen at random. So it's like a randomly generated hierarchy in a, like a tree-based model. And, and the idea is, like on this point over here, we have like a red dot there, is you, if you have a data point that's like in the middle of your training set, that it measures basically how many splits, there's a bunch of ways to do it, but you can think about it like, it's looking at how many splits do I have to make in the data until I isolate that particular point. And since that red point is surrounded by a bunch of other data, you're gonna have to do like a lot of cutting of that dimension over and over and over again to get that point to be the only data point within a terminal node of the tree. And if you have a data point over here like in black, um, since it's outlying and there's not much data for it, there's probably far fewer splits that you would randomly take um, to, to isolate that point because it's just not close to anything. And so an isolation force, um, you know, it, it uses randomness in the splits and you might do like a couple thousand trees in your forest and then it has an output that's like a measure of like outlierness of a data point. So they're really good for like looking for anomalies or seeing if things are not like the original data set that was used to build the, uh, the isolation forest. And just for kicks, that's the one I'm gonna use because it to me is pretty interesting. Um, so that's what we'll do. It's, it's also available and applicable. Um, we'll look at an example in just a second. You, you all, I mean, it seems like this conference, there's been a lot of sports data, and I'm, I'm gonna like, be the finishing touch on that. Uh, so the example I'm gonna use is from my beloved Pittsburgh Penguins. If anybody knows anything about hockey, I, I keep, somebody keeps telling me that there's like a different Penguins emblem that's on hats and stuff, but this is the one that I grew up on, and it's the only one I will, whose existence I will acknowledge. Um, I, I, one time on eBay, I was like, oh, I, I need to get one of those hats before like, you can't get them anymore. And, I, and it was like $3 and I bought it on eBay. And I, I re later realized when they sent it to me, it was like a case of them. <laughs> so I, I took it to Pittsburgh to go to all my old relatives and I divvied them all out. And I have one left. Anyway. Um, so I have some data. It's in a, I put it in a GitHub repo. Um, I took data from Pittsburgh Penguins when they were playing. Um, and, and parsed a couple seasons worth of NHL data through their API. Um, I had to do some calculations because there's interesting things about the data the API doesn't give you. Like they'll tell you if a shot is, is during a power play, or if, I'm sorry, they'll tell you if a goal is during the power play, but not a shot. So I actually went and re-implemented the arcane uh, decision tree of um, given a penalty happened here, was this shot during a power play? So we have data on the shot, like where it was taken, was it during a power play, uh, you know, where was what stadium against what team. We have information on the players, like who it was, like what position, you know, the game time, and, and so on, you can imagine. And so I decided to make an outcome um, whether a shot was on goal or not. So a shot would, be on, a shot would not be on goal is if you missed the, the goal entirely or if it was blocked by a defender. And then an on-goal shot would be something that we either went in the net or was touched by the goaltender. And so it's about a 50-50 class imbalance. I won't bore you with all the, the stuff, because honestly, I'm going to use this data set so much. It's going to be like new iris by the time I see you next year. Um, and I built a boosted tree, and I'm just sick of talking about XGBoost, so I did LightGBM just for kicks. Um, the data set I used to train was about 26,000 data points. I had a validation set of about 6,000 and a test set of about nine. Error to the RC curve came back pretty consistent, about 0.8. I'm kind of happy with this. It's not a bad model fit, um, especially for teaching. And so, you know, what we might do is we might say, like, okay, if I work for the Penguins, and I'm listening if you want to call me Pittsburgh, um, 
you know, you might build models like these to say like, oh, if, if so-and-so is taking a shot here during a shorthanded game three situation, you know, what's the, what's the chances that you're even going to get that shot on goal? So it's not like an unreasonable thing you might want to predict. So what I did is I took that training set. There's a bunch of different like, variations of ways you could do this. But I just built an isolation force model. And then what I did is you know, everything has to be relative to the training set when you do this. And so, um, so what I did is I just re-predicted the training set so that I can look at the outlierness of every individual point that I use to build the model. And so on the right-hand side here, we have this like, empirical distribution function that on the x-axis is the score that comes out of an isolation force, which larger, valor, larger values mean it's more of an anomaly of a data point, whereas values closer to zero means like you're right smack dab in the uh, middle of the training set. And then you can see here that, um, that, for example, if we get a score of about 0.35, about 39% of the training set samples were less extreme than that. So you can imagine that if you got, you know, these numbers are relative, so that's why I like doing them in terms of percentiles. Because if I told you my, my isolation for a score was 0.4, you'd be like, OK. Like there's, no, like in, there's no obvious interpretation of that. So what we do is we, we make a reference distribution out of the training set, and then we score new data. We look at the percentile and say, OK, relative to the training set, this is a really extreme value if the percentile is pretty high. So for example, if I, if I had a shot that um, was associated with a, a isolation for a score of about 0.45, there were almost no data points that were uh, more extreme than that one, because that has a very high percentile. So it's kind of a, like a way to standardize the notion of what's extreme um, relative to your training set. And so what I did is I, I took the next season, um, and for every game, I computed all the, the um, applicability scores. And in this plot, every data point is a game. And they usually have about like 100, 150 shots per game. And I just plotted here like the mean um, percentile. And so you can see like the first game of the season, the mean value is about 0.25. And, and each game has its own variation here. So some of them, the variation is very wide. Some of them are fairly tight. But on average, um, on the first game, most of the shots were exactly like the data we used to build the model. But then you can quickly see maybe after the third game, we have like one of the most extreme situations where very few, if any, of the shots that we had during that third game were, were like anything like we had in the training set. And so what we would normally do is there's going to be up and down bounces and so on. But we basically would like to monitor this or some statistic like this um, over time to look and see where like my applicability domain model is telling you, hey, you know, if it's going in one direction, like you're, you're moving further and further away from your training set. And then you know, that would be a trigger for you to go back and say, okay, okay, we should rebuild our model. Let's take the data that we've labeled since we built the model, put that in, maybe take some of the older data out, whatever we want to do, rebuild the model so it's more relevant for the type of data that we're getting like here and now. And so you, know, you can see it's not a great example maybe for the talk. You can see it's sort of trending upwards. Um, but there is a lot of variation here. So maybe like around, around January, you know, if I were doing this, I, I would probably say to myself, like, I should just take all this data and just retrain and then redo everything, maybe with better. Um, and, uh, and then you know, rebuild the model, because it seems like it's a good time to do this. Um, so when I, worked in, when I worked in drug discovery, we, we would basically, whenever we could, apply like applicability domain um, value to every prediction. So a chemist would say like, oh, I like this. You know, I've, I've on my computer designed this chemical. I think it's really good for whatever it is we wanted to make it good for. We get that equation for the chemical out. They push it through like the modeling systems that are deployed. And then you get a prediction back saying like, I don't know, there's like a, the, Oh, that's a good example. The permeability value for this is like 0.3. And the chemist would want to use that. But we would also attach basically like a, almost like a red light, green light kind of thing. Um, uh, they called it a confidence score, but that kind of drove me nuts because it's not like a confidence interval. But it was based on the applicability domain model. So if you get a, if you get a prediction back of 0.3, but it's got like a red light next to it, you could be like, uh, maybe I shouldn't really think about that data point so much, and I should maybe have that um, compound synthesized and test it for real instead of letting the model predict it. So with these data, if you were to do that, um, here are the, the two most anomalous shots in the subsequent season. One is a shot at minute, or, uh, minute 35, which was a power play. It was Sidney Crosby, who's a center. And this one makes a little bit of sense. It's nine feet, so this is like Euclidean, Euclidean distance from the goal. Uh, and it's at a fairly oblique angle, like 60, uh, 63 degrees. So he's almost, it's not 90 degrees, but he's, you know, he's almost like um, from the y-axis, like level the goal 
Um, and, and there just weren't many shots in the training set that were probably at that angle and um, in distance uh, by Sidney Crosby. The next one, I don't really have any way to tell you why this one came up to be so anomalous. It could be that this particular player, maybe, maybe they acquired him late and he didn't have that many shots in the uh, training set. Um, but I, I couldn't really tell you why the second one seems so um, egregious. Um, and so with those, you know, you might want to warn the user, like, hey, we can, the thing about models is you can always get a prediction, right? You really have no idea whether that prediction is any good. And so applicability domain methods are really built behind trying to give you some sense of whether you should believe it or not. And then if you were looking for something that's like the most mundane prediction, here's one at the bottom here where the score is about 0.56. It's 39 minutes into the game, shorthanded um, by a defenseman. 25 feet, angle of 21 degrees is not that. Um, remarkable. So um, I could kind of see why that one's not a big deal in terms of the applicability domain. So overall, if you want to learn more, here's a link that has like a Google Scholar link. And here are the, the main review papers that I, I've looked at over the years, which are actually pretty good. Um, but the whole idea of this is like we, again, we're always thinking about model drift because we're always like the model, the model, the model. But in this case, it's data. And we need to find some way to know what's coming into our model and if the population that we think we've been predicting is changing over time. So, so for example, if you're doing some sort of like promotional like advertising and you're trying to predict like who's going to take a promotion, you know, it could be that you have a new population of people that are coming into the system and you just don't have many of them. So you want to know when things are changing sort of underneath your feet. And so whether it's applicability domain method or, or something else that's like, you know, just like characterizing market segments or something like that and trying to model them, um, you know, have something that's measuring your data. Performance statistics that come out after the fact are also great and they're probably the best thing you can do. But knowing why performance is not doing well is probably a really good thing. And these types of models would make you go back and say like, okay, but why is this anomalous? And you can untangle that and figure out what's happening, which would then of course inform you about what you should be doing on the next model fit. Um, or what maybe you want to enrich your training set for the population that you're encountering now. So that's the general gist. Thank you for coming. Right on time. Right on time. I, should, I don't know if that went, if that just hit zero. I didn't see it. Trust me, it was okay. down to the second. We need to get like a negative countdown timer. Yeah. This way people know how much they go start over. Start blinking at me. Yeah, yeah exactly. They blink and it gets a lot flashier and flashier. All right, cool. Thank you. And he can't go anywhere because he's going to have to autograph his book so we could give it away. Ooh, you hear that? You hear that? They're excited. No, they're moaning because if they get it, it's like four pounds. They're like, jeez, I got to well, carry on, this thing hold home. On. These are two Springer books. Now. This one is much more substantial. What is that? Yeah. Holy shit. Uh, holy crap. <laughs> Here, take a look. And biostats, that, that's your field. It used to be your field. How many pages is that? Really? Yeah. I want to know if they use cheaper paper for you. 902. Oh, yours is 599. So it's not just cheaper. Oh, that just feels like nicer paper, too, though. Feel that. It eclipses that. <laughs> so this one, again, is going to go to one of you bio folks. We're just going to you know, find a way to get it to you. But that one.